Hello everyone, welcome back, let us continue our discussion. So, we are in the seventh week of this course and today is the first lecture. So, right now if I just quickly sum up what we have done is uh, if we have say a frame structure, then we have solved the problem for different loading conditions and different solution strategy. So, if this is the mass stiffness and damping obviously, K and C represents the collective uh, lateral stiffness offered by the two columns and also the damping in the lateral direction. So, uh, that is the uh, structure and we have defined uh, the degrees of freedom x of t. Now, the question automatically comes. So, this is a single degree of freedom system. Now, obviously, if you look at the actual structure, it has multiple degrees of freedom, right. For example, if we consider one more story here, so what we will have is another story and then for that again we have to define the mass which may be same may not be. So, if this is m 1, so the next story will have m 2. So, this is say k 1 and c 1 and next story will have k 2 c 2. And obviously, again the degrees of freedom we have to define in this case. So, x 2 for the second story. Now, the question is how to derive the equation of motion and solve this problem. So, that will be the theme of the following lectures that we are going to start today. Now, before we jump into the derivation of the equation of motion, we have to define certain mathematical tools for this type of problem. Of course, one of the way is to uh, start with the free body diagram which we will do and find out the equation of motion, but not always uh, you can draw the free body diagram and uh, that is because uh, in reality we have complex structures. Uh, it is very difficult to draw the free body diagram at uh, each and every degrees of freedom and thereby uh, I mean develop the equation of motion. So, for that uh, we will study a few um, options. So, in this course we will study Hamilton's principle then Lagrange equation and some more topic as uh, it will come I will let you know. But these are the two major topic that we are going to discuss in this course and how they are going to help us to develop the equation of motion. But before that let us uh, quickly see how we define a multi degree of freedom system. Obviously, this is a multi degree of freedom system because we have uh, more than one degrees of freedom. So, obviously, the first uh, story will have x 1 of t. Now, if you look at the degrees of freedom, what are they? x 1 and x 2. Now, let us revisit the degrees of freedom and for that we will again go back to the old example of pendulum and we will come back to this uh, two storied frame, but let us first quickly consider this pendulum and see how we define the degrees of freedom. Now, in this case what we have if you recall, we have a bob which is suspended by a cord. So, this inextensible cord actually gives us the constraint condition. So, we have a coordinate system x and y it is the origin. Obviously, this pendulum 
vibrates in two dimension. So, I am not considering the third dimension which is perpendicular to the plane that is not required for the time being. So, that is why I am not writing. So, we have a Cartesian coordinate system x and y. Now, in x y plane this bob moves. So, what we do? We give a initial displacement and then uh, allow the bob to move obviously it will rotate along this dotted path or it will swing. Now, because this chord does not change its length, so the coordinate of the new position of the bob x and y they are not independent if you recall. So, what is the constraint condition we have x square plus y square is equal to L square. And using this relation we can actually reduce these two coordinates of this point into 1 and that is what we define theta. The angle it makes from the vertical position or the initial position. Obviously, the degrees of freedom d o f in this case is theta t. And we develop the equation of motion in terms of this variable theta t. So, what we do? We plot the response. We have already derived the equation of motion. I am not writing that. So, what we have is theta t and then we plot the motion. Now, if you look at this problem, x y is the coordinate system that defines the space we call it physical space. And then this theta is what we call generalized coordinate. Now, the space formed by this generalized coordinate is called configuration space. So, these are the few terminologies we have to be very careful. Again I repeat the bob vibrates in x y plane. So, we have a Cartesian coordinate system that defines the physical space. Then the problem statement tells us that there is a constraint condition this constraint condition ensures that the length small n does not change with time and then we have a new variable theta t which we call generalized coordinate. And if you recall the definition of the degrees of freedom we said that it is the minimum number of independent coordinates we need to describe the deformed shape of the body. right? So, in this case we have only one. And the moment we define the generalized coordinate, we define a space, we call it a configuration space. So, these few terminologies will be sufficient for the time being. I am not going into the details of other mathematical descriptions of uh, this dynamic problem. But for the time being, one point to be noted is that if you look at the constraint condition, it involves x and y only. Now, this type of constraint condition, if a system satisfies, we call it holonomic system. Holonomic so, the constraint conditions are defined by x and y only. Fine. So, if I just extend this logic 
for our system what we have here again in this case we have a coordinate system that defines the physical space. But if you carefully look at the problem, we have in this case two stories just like we have frames of multiple bay multiple stories. Now, this is what we call shear building model that means the slab actually deforms or uh, vibrates in the horizontal plane, it does not move in the vertical direction. That means y1 remain constant, y2 also remain constant, it does not change with time. So, this is the constraint condition we have in this problem and the motion can be described by a new set of variables x1 and x2. So, we have a physical space defined by the Cartesian coordinates, then we have the generalized coordinate x1 and x2. This generalized coordinate defines the configurational space, right. Now, coming back to the same problem of this pendulum. So, if we have a cord which actually changes its length that means this constraint condition is no longer valid, then how many degrees of freedom we will have? We have to consider both x and y because the bob will swing in the x y plane at the same time it can also move away from this origin O. So, in that case we will have 2 degrees of freedom and the generalized coordinate will match with the physical coordinate which may not be always true. So, in this problem of uh, portal frame we have a physical space defined by the Cartesian coordinate and then we have a generalized coordinate that uh, defines the deformed shape of the body. Now, the question is if we have a dynamical system and then as time progresses the dynamical system moves from T 1 to T 2 in time and if you have a generalized coordinate say x k for the problem of pendulum we have theta. So, is there at time T 1 a position we mark it say a, then at time T 2 it goes to a position we call it b. The question is during this excursion from T 1 to T 2 which path the body is going to follow? Is it this one? Is it this one? Or is it this one or can be many other different paths? Out of all these possibilities which one the body or particle is going to follow. Now, for that we define a terminology called action integral. What is that? The action integral is actually defined by say i is the integral between time point t 1 to t 2 of L, I will explain L in a minute d t. So, what is L? It is called Lagrangian. and this is equal to t minus v, where t is the kinetic energy and v is the potential energy. Now, if you look at this kinetic energy, it depends on what? The velocity with which the particle moves. Now, the potential energy depends on what? It is the position of the particle that actually defines the potential energy. Therefore, this L 
is actually a function of if I have uh, this generalized coordinate defined by x. So, it is x, x dot and time t. Now, for this problem where we have defined the action integral, what is our objective? Our objective is to find x of t that is the or I put x k of t that is the response. If I look at this 2 degree of freedom system, our k ranges from 1 to 2. So, we have x 1 and x 2. So, our objective is to find out x 1 and x 2 and for that Hamilton's principle says that if we consider delta of i, I will define this mathematical operator in a minute. Obviously, I have to apply the same operator on the right hand side of the equation. So, the Hamilton's principle says that out of all possibilities, they call it path between A to B, the particle will follow the path which will lead to this delta i stationally. Obviously, I have to now define what is this delta which we will do in a minute and we also have to define what we mean by stationary. But at least the problem statement is now clear that we have a set of particles as in this case we have say m 1 and m 2 moving along x 1 and x 2 and our task is to find out x 1 which is a function of time, x 2 which is also a function of time, then what we can quantify is the Lagrangian that means it is the difference between kinetic energy and potential energy. Now, the moment we do that we can also quantify the action integral i and then the Hamilton principle says delta of i delta is called is the fast variation. We will define that in a minute. So, we will get x of t as the solution of this problem such that it will lead to this first variation to stationary. And if that condition is satisfied obviously, delta i will be equal to 0. So, this is what we have to satisfy to get what we will get? We will get the path that means the particle moves from A to B. So, we have defined the Hamilton's principle, we will explain all this terminology in a minute and we will see how we can use this information to derive the equation of motion. But before that, again let us quickly go through the terminologies that we have defined. First thing is physical space that normally defined by the Cartesian coordinates we generally use. Then in that physical space, we have a body that moves from one position to another position and then for that deformed shape, we define a set of coordinates we call it generalized coordinate. And the moment we define generalized coordinate and the number of generalized coordinate would be the degrees of freedom that we have to define the deformed shape. Obviously, these coordinates are minimum number of independent coordinates we need to define the deformed shape. Now, once we do that, 
Then for a system which is holonomic, I have already defined what is holonomy, we have some constraint condition and uh, this equality constraint has only you see x and y, then we have the holonomic system, then we define the Lagrangian which is the difference between kinetic energy and potential energy. The moment we define Lagrangian, we can find out the action integral between time point t1 and t2 and then the Hamilton's principle says that the first variation will be equal to 0. So, what we have defined now is called generalized coordinate. Okay. This is important. Okay. Now, the question comes in our mind that we will explore first variation and then Hamilton's principle, Lagrangian, Lagrange equation. But even before that, if we have say a beam and then uh, it is supported by a spring and a dashboard and then there is a hinge point. Let me just put the dimension. So, we have these are L. So, the beam has a length of 3 L and this is L by 2, L by 2. Now, can we write down the equation of motion for, so equation of motion for a generalized is tough system. Let us explore this first before we move into the multi degree of freedom system and uh, let us write this beam is rigid. Right. So, if the beam is rigid obviously, we have to also define an external load. So, let me just define that. So, we have a triangular load and this value, this is f of t. So, under the action of this load, it can go down and up both way. Now, obviously, the beam will vibrate. So, it will actually rotate about this hinge point, right. So, our task is to find out the generalized single degree of freedom system for this uh, complex structure. So, let us see how we can extend our previous concept of free body diagram and then uh, how we can derive the equation of motion. Then gradually we will uh, go for more complex system and we will consider multiple degrees of freedom and subsequently using Hamilton's principle and Lagrange equation we will derive their equation of motion. Now, for the time being, so what we have here is a beam whose free body diagram I am not going to, I am going to develop. So, now this is the hinge point and then the beam rotates about this point by an amount theta. 
obviously if theta is small what we can tell that the deformation at the two extreme end is if this is at a distance l. So, this will be l theta and this will be twice l theta. Okay. Now, what are the forces acting? This beam which is having a length of 3 l. So, we will have a C g somewhere here. Obviously, because of this rotation, there will be a rotational inertia. Then at this point, the force is acting say downward. So, this is the force acting, then the spring will offer a restoring force and we will also get a damping force. And then because the beam moves in this direction, so there will be a inertia force also acting. So, we have identified all the forces. So, let me just uh, write down the spring constant say k, damping constant c, mass per unit length is defined by m bar. Then obviously, this will be i theta double dot. Now, the spring force will be what? It is k times the deformation, k is the spring constant and the deformation at that point is l theta. So, we can identify the spring force. Similarly, the damping force will be c, the distance is L by 2. So, it will be L theta by 2. Then this component will be mass, total mass that is 3 L times m bar and the deformation at that point is L by 2 theta and then obviously, the inertial force will be L by 2 theta double dot. Okay. There is one more external force and that is we can easily define half L times f of t is the force acting at the point which is 3L by 2 from the hinge point. Okay. So, what we have done is we have identified the force component and the free body diagram is now complete. Then what we do? Earlier we used the equilibrium, right now we will consider a virtual displacement this virtual displacement is delta theta. Now, if that is the case, what will happen? So, we if we apply principle of virtual work, then we can identify the total work done. So, let us start. So, first component i theta double dot times delta theta. 
plus second component is 3 L m bar L by 2 theta double dot and then at that point the deformation virtual deformation is L by 2 delta theta plus you have a spring force. So, k times L theta and the virtual deformation at that point is L delta theta then plus we have the damping force and that is C L theta by 2 and the virtual displacement at that point is L by 2 delta theta. Then minus we have an external force that is half L f of t times the virtual displacement along the path of this force is 3 L by 2 delta theta and this is equal to 0. So, what we have done? We first develop the free body diagram, then apply a virtual displacement and then apply the principle of virtual work that gives us this equation. And what we can do? We can take this delta theta common. So, what we have inside the third bracket is i theta double dot plus we have 3 L cube by 4 m bar theta double dot plus k L square theta plus c L square divided by 4 theta minus 3 L square by 4 times f of t is equal to 0. Obviously, delta theta is not equal to 0. Then what we have i, we can take this theta double dot common. So, what we have 3 L cube by 4 m bar times theta double dot plus C L square by 4 theta dot one theta dot is missing I think this will be a dot I have missed a dot here damping force will be L theta dot by 2 just there is a small correction. So, we have identified the damping force and then k L square theta is equal to 3 L square by 4 f of t. So, that is the equation of motion we are looking at. So, what will be the natural frequency of the system? Natural frequency will be square root of k L square divided by i plus 3 L cube by 4 times m bar. What is i? i is 1 by 12 3 L m bar times 3 L square. So, you can calculate that it will be 9 L cube m bar divided by 4. So, if you look at this problem, we have identified the equation of motion and the natural frequency of the system. So, we started with a complex system, then for that we adopted a 
new technique we call it principle of virtual work and then using that we have find out the generalized s of system that represents the dynamics of this structure and for that the equation of motion is ready. You can again see this equation of motion is second order linear differential equation that we have already solved for the single degree of freedom system and we have the natural frequency of the system also identified. So, this is another way to actually develop the equation of motion where we apply a virtual displacement and then using the concept of virtual work we can derive the equation of motion. So, earlier we used equilibrium, now we use principle of virtual work. Now, if we just continue on that, say we have a beam and this beam is having UDL. So, this is f x of t and then obviously, we first define the coordinate system x and y and then we define the geometry so L and the flexural rigidity of the beam. So, that defines the complete problem. So, our task is to find out what is the what is the first natural frequency. For that what we can do again, uh, we can adopt the concept of generalized uh, SDOF system. Now, in this case what will happen? The beam is expected to deform because we already know it is a cantilever beam. So, it is going to deform in this way. So, the deformation at the free end uh, is marked here and because of this forcing function which is also varying with time, the beam will undergo some level of vibration and y is the deformation y x of t is the deformed shape of the beam. Now, ideally speaking, how many degrees of freedom we have in this case? Because if we consider every point along the path x that we need to define the deformed shape. So, it has more than one obviously infinite number of degrees of freedom in this case, but we can consider this continuous system and we can find out the first natural frequency very easily. For that what we do? We define this y x of t using separation of variables. So, this is phi of x times say y of t. So, the free end deforms with time by a function y of t and then we multiply that y of t by this phi of x we call it shape function. Obviously, the value of shape function will be 1 at the free end and then we can define the deformed shape of the body. Now, in this case what is the kinetic energy? It is 0 to L half we consider a differential element. So, we have mass per unit length say m bar 
times dx that is the mass of the differential element dx from the origin at a distance x and at that point y dot x comma t is the velocity. Now, if you look at the expression of the deformed shape, what is y dot x comma t? It is phi of x times y dot of t. So, if we put that expression here, 0 to L half m bar, then we have dx in place of y dot x, we have phi of x times y dot of t. Now, obviously, the integral is over x, so we can write down this as half m bar phi of x. Oh, there is one square missing here, half m times v square. So, this will be square, this will be square. So, we have phi square x dx y dot square t, which means this is what this is the mass of the equivalent s dub system. So, what we have here is half m equivalent times y dot square of t. Our mass equivalent for the generalized s dub system is 0 to l m bar phi square x dx. Fine. So, if we now find out what is the potential energy, sorry, or strain energy, So, we define it by the term V and that is what? This is equal to 0 to L half m of x times d theta. What is m or m of x? This is the bending moment at x. Now, all of you know the relation between the flexural rigidity and this bending moment and this is d 2 y d x 2 is equal to d theta d x is equal to your bending moment at x divided by d y. Now, if we define y x, so we can actually find out what is d y d x and for that we have phi prime of x times y of t. Similarly, we can also find out what is d 2 y d x 2 and which is equal to phi double prime x y of t. Okay. So, what is d theta? d theta is equal to m x d x divided by e i. So, 
let us find out this v what we have 0 to l half m x then in place of d theta we can write m x d x divided by e i. So, ultimately what we have half m square x so 0 to l half m square x and for that we can write down e i times we have d 2 y d x square whole square d x divided by e i. So, this is equal to 0 to l half e i and then in place of d 2 y d x 2 we can write down phi double prime x y of t whole square then d x. Again what we can see the integral is over x, so we can collect all the terms. So, what we have L half E i phi double prime x whole square d x times y square of t and this we can write half k equivalent into y square of t. So, what is k equivalent? This is integral 0 to l e i phi double prime x whole square d x. So, we have identified the stiffness and mass of the equivalent system. So, what will be omega n that is the generalized fast natural frequency or omega, square, omega n square it will be k equivalent divided by m equivalent. So, we have derived the fast natural frequency of the generalized um, SDF system for this case. Now, we can also write down the expression for damping and the external force. Let us complete that problem and then we will move further. So, for that let us make some space here. So, because we need the diagram. So, we have the deformed shape and uh, we will define damping force first and then we will consider the external force acting on the generalized SDF system. So, once we identify mass, stiffness, damping and the force then we can write down the equation of motion. Okay. Now, for the damping, so if you have C equivalent as the damping obviously C equivalent y dot will be the damping force and then that multiplied by delta y is basically the virtual work done. So, if we look at this expression then uh, we can expand what will be this term 0 to L C the damping constant times the differential element times y dot of x comma t that is the total damping force 
times delta y that is the virtual displacement delta y of x comma t. So, if you look at this uh, expression of deformed shape what will be delta y comma x comma t it will be phi of x times delta y of t. So, obviously, if we put all the expression what we have 0 to l c in place of y dot x comma t what we will have phi x that is a function of space then times y dot of t then for delta y we have phi of x times delta y of t times d x. So, if we again simplify delta y dot or sorry delta y yeah. So, what we have 0 to l c phi square x d x y dot of t times delta of y t. So, what is the c equivalent then? c equivalent is equal to 0 to l c phi square x d x. So, we get the expression of equivalent damping. Now, the last component is actually the external work done and that we can again uh, define very easily. So, if we consider the external force, the external work done will be 0 to L f x comma t d x that is the force times delta y and again in place of delta y what we can write is phi x times delta y of t. So, this is equal to 0 to L f x t phi of x d x and then delta y of t. So, what is force equivalent? It is 0 to L f x comma t phi of x d x. So, we have identified equivalent mass you also have equivalent stiffness, then equivalent damping and the equivalent force. So, we can easily write down the second order linear differential equation that describes the motion of this body. Ultimately, what we will solve from that equation is capital Y of t that means, this quantity and the moment we identify the solution, we can completely define the deformed shape because we have already defined the shape functions. So, now you have seen that there are different ways we can actually adapt for uh, developing the equation of motion and the main point to be noted in these problems is that if we have a complex system as in this case we have this beam, we can write down the generalized rest of system and then the equation of motion for the generalized rest of system and then we can solve it. Although, we know that this system is having multiple degrees of freedom. Of course, for that system we will derive the equation of motion, but the point to be noted here is that even if we have a multi degree of freedom system, we can convert it into a equivalent single degree of freedom system 
and for that we can adapt the principle of virtual work and then using that we can establish the equation of motion. As we progress in this course, we will solve some more problem using this concept and we will see how just by assuming the shape function or the deformed shape of the body, we can easily derive the natural frequency, first natural frequency at least for the system. Because from the designer's point of view, it is the natural frequency that is the most important parameter because we have already discussed the response spectrum method. There, the input for that response spectrum analysis is basically the time period. So, if we identify the natural frequency of this system, then we can find out the maximum response from the response spectrum for a given earthquake and obviously for a given damping level. Damping also we have estimated. So, we can find out what is the equivalent critical damping ratio. So, from this we can find out easily what will be equivalent critical damping ratio. So, using this information we can find out what will be the maximum response of the uh, structure and the moment we quantify maximum response, we can use that information for our design. So, that completes the problem, but the point to be noted here is that we can use the concept of equilibrium, where uh, we use the Newton's law or D. Lambert's principle. We can derive the equation of motion. We have discussed the principle of virtual work and then using that also we can derive the equation of motion. Obviously, the moment we adopt this uh, technique, we first need to assume some shape function which is um, consistent with the deformed shape of the body. That is a huge task for a complex structure, but at least for some structures we can easily identify as in this case of a cantilever beam because we know how the cantilever, be, cantilever beam deforms and for that we can actually write down a possible shape function and then we can solve this problem very easily. Obviously, if we have a wrong shape function, then our estimations will be erroneous, but as I said for a large class of problem, we beforehand know what will be the expected deformed shape and for that we can easily adapt this technique and find out the natural frequency. So, with that let me close here, we will continue our discussion. First, we will see how we can use other techniques. So, first we will consider the conservation of energy and then using that we will again derive the equation of motion because we have mostly the systems that we deal with, they are conservative system. So, if we have a system where the energy is conserved, we can use that principle to derive the free vibration equations very easily that we will discuss in the next lecture and then gradually we will move over to multi degree of freedom system with the help of Hamilton's principle and Lagrange equation. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm.